so you think uh, the people, the Aboriginal people, showed up at Tierra del Fuego around right around fifty thousand years ago in the wake of this third migration? That's part of your uh, theory. You would say, yeah, because if you think about it, that's we've got a, we know there's a migration underway around that time. That's mm-hmm. absolutely accepted. We know there's a movement of people throughout you know, Eurasia. Obviously, the usual starting point is considered to be East Africa. But one thing I, you know, I can certainly agree on with everyone else is that we know people are, you know, moving at that time. So it's it's funny that that's when we find the first traces of um, early modern humans, you know, down in South America, coinciding right. with this time of early, you know, migrations of modern, of completely, you know, behaviorally, culturally modern humans. And so the cause of this migration would be something uh, akin to the Lake Toba eruption and some climate shifts. Is that what is that like the cent- the central uh, event that that spurned this third migration? Because part of your theory is the, mm-hmm. there are these three migrations that you talk about: uh, one two hundred thousand years ago, one seventy four thousand years ago, and the last one sixty thousand years ago. And the last mm-hmm. two are directly the result of this uh, Lake Toba uh, eruption. Am I correct on that? Yes, I mean, I would modify some of my thoughts that are in the book, so I would update that a little bit. Now, where rather than needing necessarily the the earlier migration at 200,000 years ago, I, I think that what we probably had is from around about, um, well, very early on, I think from probably around 700,000 years ago, we have a loosely flung population of very archaic ancestors of modern humans spread all the way between Africa and Australia, you know, throughout. Is this the pre, I'm sorry, is this the pre L3 uh, haplogroup lineage that you talk about? Yeah, this would be much earlier. So these would probably be, um, you know, L, L0 people. Oh, and wow. Okay. This is going back to the really the, the first branch that splits away from assumably Homo erectus. Now, mm. there's some debate there. Some people right. suspect it may have been an Australopithecine type hominin. But basically, that we know that there was a split around about 750,000 years ago-ish, uh, which begins the lineages which will lead to Neanderthals, Denisovans, and us. We don't know for sure what the ancestral group is, but we can, you know, let's say, um, we'll call it Homo erectus. Um, but at that point, I think what we have, soon after that, we find remains in the Philippines of someone using tools there, which suggests boat, right, or watercraft. Mm-hmm. That's a recent find. We know that somebody was here in Flores. We know that there's tools there going back to up to a million years. We know so we know people are moving around in the Southeast Asian, you know, island regions, right, around this time. Uh, we also know that there is well, the genetics pointing to a split is underway, the diversification of new populations, large brained hominins. Um, and I, I would say that what we likely have here, and if we go from my own um, model is that we have a movement out of Australasia. We have hominins that have entered the region a million years ago, evidenced by these tools in Flores, and um, that they would have inevitably made their way to Australia. Because once you get, once you cross Wallace's line, which is obviously the geological yes. barrier between, yeah, it's important to highlight to people because, you know, it was always understood that the Wallace's line was essentially a, a near impenetrable barrier for large mammals and that, you know, it separated the indigenous life of Australasia from that of mainland Asia. Now, very few creatures crossed that barrier. Rats and a few small, you know, animals, obviously birds and whatnot can cross, but, you know, yeah. uh, most could because there's intensely strong currents that flow through the Indonesian islands, right, which will which move to the southwest, and they will just carry you out into the Indian Ocean. So the idea that you can kind of just swim between the islands, you know, and, mm-hmm. or be washed along, it's been positive, but you really can't, you know, apart from sharks, um, salt or crocs, um, right. jelly bit, you know, all the other risks that we know. That's a dangerous stretch of sea uh, to then factor in that we have intense currents flowing through, pulling you out into the Indian Ocean, right? So the idea that you can just, you know, swim across is out, you have to travel at one point about 100 miles at sea. So you need really to be on some kind of watercraft, right? Yeah, and even now, if they were able to cross the the, um, the Wallace Line, I mean, there's the Timor Straits, which is absolutely also a formidable uh, patch of uh, uh, stretch of ocean as well. Um, and absolutely. so the so Homo erectus then, the implication is they had watercraft that was not just mm-hmm. like a raft, but I mean, they were capable of crossing this line. And do you yeah. think that, 
is sort of like an ancestral technology that these uh, that that the people their their direct ancestors were uh, privy to. I guess they were using. Yes, Do you think they were mm-hmm. using that to cross? Because back then the sea level was a lot lower. So I mean, yeah, but it's risen and fallen a couple of times. But yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. we're assuming that during most of these movements would be at times when yeah the sea levels were you know more favoring movements. According to the mainstream, people weren't using boats until very very recent like 4000 something years ago right so this totally throws a monkey wrench into that yeah and i'm wary as well when we say boats i mean we're probably dealing when we say we have to say watercraft because yes. watercraft is much simpler right you right. know like um possibly a um you know, a raft you know made out of bamboo lashed together with vines you know as a simple watercraft right mm-hmm. so that is something we can readily imagine you know early hominins figuring out right because yes. you know if you see bamboo floating in rivers which, which if you're in southeast asia you're going to see right you're going to see that regularly and in fact you know a, a child's natural thing is to i mean i've played on those when i've been in trinidad is where I'm, my family are from playing on the bamboo you know and and you know using that as a floating aid right so it doesn't take a huge leap to think you know well, five pieces floats me better than two pieces etc right and then you're also used to vines there's vines everywhere in, the, in those jungles right there's vines everywhere so it doesn't take a huge leap for somebody to figure out you know i can tie the vine round these bamboo sticks and make something that i can float on better right so we're not talking about a boat you know with oars and sails and stuff mm-hmm. so that probably does come much much later but I think that we can certainly allow for the idea that someone could lash some some vines around some bamboo right. sticks, right? Um, and that that's sufficient. You know, you can use that to cross between islands in in Southeast Asia with trouble. I, I don't think it'd be easy even with that. But obviously, it becomes viable. You know, because you can carry some water, you can carry some food on your little raft, and you can potentially, you know. I suppose whether you're swimming it along or if you do, but I don't know. I mean, I don't expect it's too much just to sails, but you know, or oars, but obviously it's possible that you use some kind of stick or something as an oar to move mm-hmm. yourself along. But either way, you know, you're starting to deal with the problem of how do you cross between islands, right? In a fairly simple way. Um, other, other arguments we put in that perhaps, perhaps some people were washed off of an island by a tsunami and carried between these islands. But I mean, that's to me is, is nonsensical, right? Because first of all, you know, we've all seen the, the effects of a serious tsunami. I mean, you, A, you've got to survive. And yes, some people survive in the water mm-hmm. and are washed out to sea. Now you're now at sea. You've got no raft, nothing. Um, you may be lucky enough to have a log floating or something. Um, but then the, the, the water doesn't carry you towards the island and this is another problem that no one seems to tackle is that a tsunami at sea doesn't really carry you it just passes beneath you right that you you would just feel a, a slight you know bobbing in the water as it passes the tsunami really only manifests when it hits land yeah it's of no particular use for carrying you between islands now the, the second problem you have there is that you need a, a whole population right who have been swept out and all successfully made it to the island at the same time you know they have to arrive at the same time so you have breeding pairs to establish a population now is it likely that say a hundred people are washed out all get lucky enough to get logs and are all able to somehow paddle you know in the right direction and end up on flores so it's you know you start getting into this really fanciful way of trying to say we're not allowing them watercraft you know mm-hmm. that they can't have had them whereas it's much simpler to say they figured out watercraft it's the thing that makes sense for what we're seeing in the data right if you've crossed wallace's line and you've gone through you know several islands already you, you've done the hard part all you have left is one more stretch of water and you reach the, the huge coastlines of australia that you've done all the hard work yeah. now it's generally been assumed that there were no humans there until about you know, 60,000 years ago or so. Now they're, they're giving it. it's gone up over the last few years. From right. If you go back a couple of decades, you know, it goes back to about 30,000 or 20,000 years. And they've had to keep pushing that date back. And now we're up to about 50, 60,000 with other studies coming up, which are going to suggest 120,000. Yeah, like rock um, shelters. There's like a 55,000 year old rock shelter in Australia and that's pushing it back. Yeah, in the north, we've got the 65,000, 65 to 80,000 year old shelter, but um, up in the north in Arnhem Land, mm, right? Mm-hmm. And the dating there is considered conservative by some of the sort of the thermoluminescence experts right. saying that, you know, they've been very conservative, that 80,000 plus is probably 
you know, supportable from what they've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but also there are there's evidence of early fire stick farming at several sites, including Lake George uh, and also at the Great Barrier Reef. And they found core sampling, which suggests that there was deliberate burning, you know, the traditional Aboriginal practice of deliberate burning that it was underway 120,000 years ago. So that pushes it. You know, that's I think is going to push it back. We're going to see that quite soon anyway. Um, but apart from that, you know, we have this, this this huge gap that, you know, there's hominins in Flores. There's hominins all throughout these islands, but none of them reach Australia, even though they've crossed Wallace's line. Now, this is a huge glaring anomaly, because if you've come that far, there's nothing to stop you now hitting the coastline, even if it's by accident, even if someone on their raft is washed along. There's a good chance at that point someone's going to end up on the north coast of Australia, right? So I infer that we have to start being a bit logical here and saying the absence of the evidence isn't evidence of absence. Rather, that we have the problem there's been huge sea level rises and we've lost the northern coastline. If we still had that coastline, I suspect we would see some very, very ancient sites dotted around, right? Now, with ocean you know, exploration, we may still find some evidence, but not many people want to get into that you know, ocean archaeology business, it's expensive, difficult, you know, you've got a, it's a huge Australian coastline, where to start looking. So I don't know if that's going to happen. But the rational thing is to say that probably if a million years ago, hominins were on Flores, let's say within a hundred, let's be really like, you know, generous, within a hundred thousand years, someone's going to hit the Australian coastline, someone, because it becomes nonsensical to think that they wouldn't, having seen them, they've now crossed all of these islands of mm-hmm. indonesia so you if you say why would they well why would they cross the islands of indonesia so these people are moving around they are human yeah and they're, they're exploiting your resources maybe an island uh, runs out of resources they move on right and so where do you move on to next well there's a vast continent just to your south you know so i think that we had people there very early now this is where obviously i i differ from recent reason out of africa well out of africa in general mm-hmm. i say that these hominins reached australia around probably around nine hundred thousand years ago but the interesting thing is we don't really see the split between you know, other archaic hominins and the ancestors of Homo sapiens till around around 750, 800,000 years ago. So that's beyond my generous you know, limit there, right. that they only need to have separated off you know, 900,000, 800,000 years ago to be in the right place for things to be happening there rather than Africa. Now, interestingly, from a very a consensus kind of point of view, we know that species... Um, divergence is often encouraged by either cataclysms or other things that cause bottlenecks. And so one of the things that causes a bottleneck, of course, is a small group reaching a huge continent yeah, and being trapped there in some respect mm-hmm. and then taking advantage of those resources. We also know evolution is driven partly by new environments. <laughs> We've got an entirely new environment with unique species by you know, absolutely you know, vast numbers. And we've got, of course, the marsupials. And so totally unique species, a unique and, and vast landmass. Now, if you imagine a small population of, of early hominins reach it, they're going to experience accelerated evolution yes. merely by reaching the place, right? And then, of course, now you've got a bottleneck. And <laughs> so you, you start to have things happen at the genetic level, which encourage species, speciation, right? So in those, and I know Mitch Ukeku spoke on this, and he said, you know, he would have expected something, you know, to happen to early humans reaching Australia for those very same reasons. So it's not something that, you know, I'm alone in thinking this, you know, there are are the very genius minds out there have, have pondered that and thought, you know, it makes a lot of sense that the, the pressures on you there are very different um, and that that would encourage change, right? So if we then imagine that um, we have this underway, this change, you know, around 700,000 years ago, and now that there's movements in that area, as so we find these early hominins in the Philippines, we don't know they've got remains, but they've got cut marks and whatnot on bones it seems again people are moving around at that time which is mm-hmm. after the point where we started to emerge so i'm suspecting these are early ancestral homo sapiens if you like yes. depends what you want to call them um or the hobbit I should people, clarify here. the hobbit Sorry, people, yeah. Your homo luzonensis yeah mm-hmm. um, yeah look here yeah, look at how they're finding all of these different um, hominins throughout the indonesian islands and the philippines right that right. where once it was thought nothing much was going on mm-hmm. now we have evidence of of several you know unique homo species and possibly you know florid the floresiensis they've even thought maybe the ancestors of those were an early australopithecine due to mm-hmm. the, you know, the the small stature that yes. suggests that they're not coming from homo erectus but something even earlier right mm-hmm. now that's interesting because if, let's say, an Australopithecine has managed to make its way down to Flores and then it hits Australia, it may be that all Homo 
have emerged in that region and that they've radiated back out and that they, you know, the, the base clade of Homo may be even down there. We don't know. But if Australopithecines are, are ranging the world, you know, millions of years, I say, let's say a million, two million, three million, who knows, years ago, right? I mean, recently they found evidence, I think up in um, somewhere in the Middle East of, of early sites, 2.5 million years old, right? Which they've yes. suggested, it's like hominin sites, right? Mm -hmm. So if we've got, We've got these Australopithecines, some sort, you know, or perhaps it's um, a very early Homo that's outranging the world at that time. That really, really, really makes you think: Why are we limiting the story to Africa, right? Because that is very it, interesting. It, it is interesting because, and again, this is why I take a bit of a multi-regional view. I think yes, things probably are changing in Africa too, but we can't just discount all of these these hominins that are everywhere else 